I truly believe that this is a stop moment for us. And so if you're scrolling through your feed, I just want to encourage you to stop and to lean in and to receive all that God has for you today. And I know what I'm asking because stopping is not something that's easy for me either. I love to multitask. I like to live my life at 110 miles an hour and just keep going, going, going. But there's times that we just need to stop because God wants to speak to us and he wants to impart something to us. And if I ever needed any evidence that I don't like to stop, I would have to tell you that it arrived in my mailbox about two weeks ago when there was a picture of my minivan going through a red light. And I got to tell you that it was on the way to a women's conference in Virginia Beach, and I am not claiming innocence by any means. But you know how it is when there are voices and conversations and things going on, and you want to be a part of those conversations. And then I had Google Maps, and it was on my leg, and it was telling me that up ahead there was a left-hand turn. And so I was participating in the conversations. I was concentrated on the left-hand turn that was coming up. But between where I was and that left-hand turn, there was a red light that I never saw till I was actually going through it. And fortunately, there was no one else in the intersection, and no one was hurt during that time. But it was a reminder that came into the mail, and it reminded me, there's times that you just need to stop. And that's true for us as individuals, and I really believe that we're in a stop moment for our culture as well. I mean, right now we are dealing with this coronavirus pandemic, and I believe that God is saying, we need to stop. We need to turn our hearts back to him and listen to what he has to say and just focus on what God wants from and through us in this world that we're living in right now. I mean, we have all been impacted by COVID-19 in some way, shape, or form and the impacts that it's had. I know my family, I'm a mom of three, and so a month ago, we were living life as usual. We were living a fast-paced life. The kids would go to school. We would be consumed by baseball practice and flag football and early morning band rehearsals, and we would just go, go, go. And that's come to a stop. And my husband, who is self-employed, he had several months of work lined up that has just pretty much slowed down. And I believe that God is calling us to, to stop, to slow down. And the, the impact goes on and on. I mean, as a matter of fact, I, I lost my uncle a week ago following his COVID-19 diagnosis. And so as we continue to be impacted by this, we have a choice that we're going to make. How are we going to react to it? And Pastor Sam, he's been leading us on Sunday mornings through a reaction series because all of us react in some shape or form to everything that happens to us. And every time we react, it causes a chain reaction that can lead to traction or distraction to our destiny. It's really up to us to choose. And so I want to follow that thought again today. How are we going to react to what's happening in the world around us? How are we going to react? Are we going to be one to give or are we going to be one to take? Acts 20, 35 says, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Yet when we face crisis and we're dealing with fear, it's natural for us to go into a self-preservation mode. But we have to be so careful that it doesn't become greed. Because God warns us in Luke 12, 15, he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he says in Proverbs eleven twenty eight, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. In times of calm and in times of calamity, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to react? Are we going to be ones who give or are we going to be ones who take? One is driven by faith and the other is driven by fear. I think this is evident from the pictures that we saw of the empty shelves where the toilet paper once was just a few weeks ago, right? It's so easy to go into that self-preservation mode and you just want to take, 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 and you want to make sure that you and your loved ones are all cared for. But really, is that what God's calling us to do? Are we reacting out of faith or are we reacting out of our fear? Faith is what shifts our reliance from ourself to our reliance on God. I'm going to read this morning from Matthew 6, 26 to 34. And it says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to this life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you of you of little faith? 
So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and all will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And you know, it was this passage in scripture a few years ago, along with really diligently praying the Lord's Prayer, that I felt like the Holy Spirit convicted me. Because I would pray, give us, Lord, our daily bread. That I was trusting in God for our daily bread. But when I would go to the grocery store, I got to tell you, I'm a sucker for sales. And I wouldn't think twice about just clearing a shelf. If there was something on sale, I would think, well, I have a much better spot in my pantry or in my bathroom closet for all of these things that my family will need and enjoy. But I felt at that time that God was really saying, do you believe what you're reading? Do you believe what you're praying? that you don't have to worry about tomorrow, that you don't have to worry about those things, that you don't have to rely on yourself, that you can rely on me, that I am your source of daily bread. And it's really changed the way I shop, to be completely honest with you, because two weeks ago when I went to the grocery store, things are a little bit different. And so, trust me, I am not going to tell you that I denied the last bunch of bananas when I went up to the produce section, because if there's just one more there, I'm going to say, thank you, God, for your favor. Lord, thank you that you give us good gifts. Thank you that you provide for all of my needs. But then as I made my way over to the, to the area where there was the almond milk and I opened up the case, there were only two there. And I thought, I don't want to be the person who robs someone else of their blessing, but I want to be the answer to someone's prayer. So I'm only going to take one of these. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are my daily bread and that I can rely on you for the needs that I have. And that is how my mindset has shifted. Because I don't want to be a taker, but I want to be a giver. I want to receive what God has for me. But I want to trust him that he is going to continue to provide for each and every need that I have. In Solomon's wisdom, he was the wisest man to ever live. He tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes, that there's nothing new under the sun. And so what's reassuring and comforting about that is that in every situation we face, we can turn to God's word. Because we know that someone has gone through something that we can learn from. And that God wants to guide us and teach us in the ways that we are to react and to respond. And so as we are in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, we can look to God's word and we can see how the people in the Bible dealt with calamity and the lessons they learned, and we can hone from that. And so that's what I wanted to do when I was looking in the book of Acts, and I wanted to see how the New Testament church was responding to some horrible things that were happening in their time. And we can see in chapter 11, verses 27 to 30, how the New Testament church responded when there was a famine forecasted among their region. It says, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. They did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. And so what's happening here is there is a famine on the horizon. And the disciples are given a choice. How are they going to react? Are they going to give or are they going to take? Are they going to gather up food for themselves and for their families? But what we see in the passage of Acts 11 is that these disciples decided to receive an offering and to give it to their brothers. These disciples responded by giving. And what fascinates me is that's the end of the chapter. There's no more mention of this famine in the book of Acts and even in the Bible. It doesn't mention lives lost. It doesn't mention the hardships. Now, I imagine if there's a famine that is infecting, affecting the entire Roman world, that there's going to be hardship. But I believe that by the disciples' actions to give and to share what they had with one another, that they took the sting out of that because it wasn't mentioned and it didn't have a detrimental effect on the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so that is what I want to be a part of. I want to be part of a a family, a church, a people group who is generous because we know that generosity eases hardship and it produces blessing. And the, the result of what they did, it didn't just bless their brothers in Judea, but I believe that it also sustained them as well. Because God gives us the promise in Proverbs 22, 9, it says, the generous themselves will be blessed for they will share their food with the poor. And so as we come together and we're generous and we give to those in need, What does it look like to be a generous person, and how does that impact our individual lives? If we go back two chapters to Acts 9, we are introduced to a woman named Tabitha, and this woman was a generous woman. 
It says in verses 36 to 42, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas. And so this woman was known by two names. She lived in a port city where people were coming and going. It was multicultural. And because she was known by two different names, we can believe that she was out and about, that she had influence where she was, and that she was someone who interacted with others. She had a willingness to reach out. It says that she was always doing good and helping the poor. She wasn't someone who was idle. She wasn't someone who was worried about herself and promoting herself, but she was out helping others, doing good, and serving the poor. Verse 37 continues, About that time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. You know, I want to suggest to you today that generosity ushers the supernatural into our lives. The act of giving releases blessing and honor, and it unlocks kingdom favor into our personal world. If we look back at the story of Tabitha, we see that she was a seamstress. She was someone who worked behind the scenes. She wasn't in the spotlight, but she worked ever so diligently to make other people beautiful. We know that she held a high standard of excellence because when Peter came to visit, the individuals who were in the room showed Peter her works, the robes, the clothing that she had made. Yet as exquisite as her work was, Tabitha was known more for the way that she loved people than the works of her hands. It was evidenced by the people in the room who were mourning and grieving her loss. John 13, 35 says that by this they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And if we look back at the first verse, when we were first introduced to Tabitha, it doesn't say that there was a seamstress named Tabitha. It says there was a disciple named Tabitha. So we know that Tabitha loved well. And through her acts of love and giving and encouragement, I believe that this woman was a beacon of heaven, that she ushered the supernatural into her life by the way that people were attracted to her, and she did it in such a way that gave glory to a loving God and a wonderful, wonderful father. And my impression is that this story that we just read about, it, it's not so much about the miracle that God performed through Peter, but it is about how Tabitha enabled God's supernatural power to flow through her by the way she lived, because she was a giver. Second Chronicles 16.9 says that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And God strengthens us by his Holy Spirit. And it was by his Holy Spirit that Peter prayed. And this woman who was dead was raised back to life. And you know, we are in an integral time right now. And right in this moment, we are in Holy Week. And on Sunday, Easter Sunday, we will celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But I think beginning today, we can begin to celebrate the dead coming to life again in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We serve a God whose resurrection power just wasn't on display 2,000 years ago, but it is alive and it's active today. And God is responding to his sons and daughters. I know some of you who are watching right now, you might have air in your lungs, but there are dead spots in your heart where dreams have died, where relationships have died, where hope has died. I know some of you right now, there are medical professionals who have told you that, that your organs are failing, that your wombs are barren, that your nerve endings have died. But I want to tell you that there is new life available for you today. Isaiah 43, 19 says, See, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. All you need to do is to ask and believe and receive to begin your inward transformation. 
The outworking of your faith will be evidenced through your generosity. And as you continue to give, I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit will be manifested in your life and that you will experience complete wholeness, healing, and deliverance so that you, like Tabitha, can be someone who attracts people to you so that you can bring honor and glory to your Heavenly Father and you can be a testimony to the people around you that your God is good and that he is powerful and that he wants to save them. Maybe you are a little bit skeptical of what I'm saying, or you're saying this doesn't make sense, but I want you to know that you can trust me when I say you're not living if you're not giving. Your best life is a generous one. You're defeated once you stop giving. I know some of you are tired. I know some of you are fearful. Some of you may be wondering, what's the point? What's the purpose? But I want to say to you today, don't you dare give up, that this is your moment. You've asked for a sign from God, and this is it. The strategy for winning your battle and pursuing victory is generosity. It's not because God needs what you have, but it's because he wants to bless you with more. And the more you give away, the more he will replenish you. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says that you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And, you know, so as individuals and as a culture, we have got to forfeit the mindset that we are consumers, and we have got to forfeit that consumer mentality. We have got to adopt and adapt to the mindset that we are called to be contributors, that every day we wake up in the morning, there is purpose for us. There is purpose for us to praise him. There is purpose for us to encourage others, to share what we have, and to serve the people around us. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, I've been around church a long time. And I've heard people say on more than one occasion about church services or prayer meetings or small groups, I didn't really get much out of that. And I got to tell you in the back of my mind, the thought that occurs to me, it's not really the nicest one. But I, I think to myself sometimes, well, congratulations, you've been around the Christian block a few times. But the question isn't really what did you get out of it, but what have you contributed towards it? You know, we have so much potential in our lives, and I truly believe with all my heart that each and every person has the ability to change the world, one person at a time, one act and deed at a time, one thought at a time, that we can really create a positive change when we allow God to use us to bless the people around us, when we are generous to give what we have, when we are generous with the words that we say, and we can build each other up in love. But too often, We wrap ourselves in insecurities and we pull back. And instead of stepping out and being the answer to someone else's prayer, we just prefer our own comfort. I want to challenge you today to alter your mindset and position yourself for divine opportunities that will allow you to use your story and to use your gifts to bless someone else. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it to the full. You know, the enemy is a taker, but Jesus is the giver. And Jesus is the best example that we have of someone who gives. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave up his life so that we could be saved from a wicked world and a horrid eternity. It's a free gift, and all you have to do is receive it. You can't purchase it. It's a free gift of grace that's given to us. 